The Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to thank my the two previous speakers for outlining a number of the uh, concerns that they have with the budget. Um, they've both um, done exa exhaustive looks at the budget in different ways. Um, I, I think that a budget, every budget tells a story. It, the, it, a budget tells a story about what's important to a government. And so with that opening line that my colleague uh, from Halifax, Shabakdil, mentioned about this being a compassionate uh, budget, I, I think it, t the budget told a story about how the government would like to be seen. It wants to be seen as compassionate. But as, as we've heard here tonight, there's no additional help for seniors. Um, there's no help, additional help for those who are looking for assistance with rising costs, unless, unless you're um, accessing fertility treatment, um, unless you have a child under the age of 18 and you get the Nova Scotia Child Benefit. Persons with disabilities have further assistance and there's a tax credit for children's sports and arts program and all of those are are important but they're not they're not enough and and, and I guess last year's budget with a hundred dollar per adult increase is probably difficult to top but but and I and it doesn't but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try and we had no idea when, when we did that hundred dollar per adult increase that inflation would be as bad as it was this year we had hoped the hundred dollars per adult would go long, go a further ways along uh, and I so wish that it had. So we don't have an increase to income assistance. And, and that's a really big issue because the people who are at, who are at the lower, who have lower incomes here in this province are the people for whom the cost of living is squeezing. It's squeezing their lives. For them, not having an increase is much more serious than you or I not getting an increase. And we know that, that rentals have been particularly squeezed at the lower end because those have suddenly become very attractive to investors. So we're seeing in many, many different uh, constituencies, and we've heard from, from the member for Dartmouth North uh, in particular, for Halifax Atlantic, we've heard in particular about landlords moving in, buying up these buildings, uh, evicting, renovicting their, um, their clients, and suddenly a, a rental that was um, affordable on income assistance with a lot of creativity, I suppose, um, is suddenly coming back on the market at double or more the cost of the rental. And that's why the ban on rent evictions was so important and that's why it was coupled with the rent cap. Because if you don't, if you don't have a ban on rent evictions, that becomes an easy way for a landlord uh, to to take in more money, do some renovations, and, and get some, some new, uh, new tenants in. So that part wasn't compassionate. And we're, as has been noted, we're now facing the highest rates of inflation that we've seen in, in three decades. We've just seen the biggest jump in interest rates that we've seen in two decades. Uh, uh, uh. A 50 basis point increase has been unheard of for two decades, and yet we have that on top of what was a quarter percentage um, increase earlier in the year. And for people who, um, 
who don't have a lot of disposable income, unfortunately living on, on credit cards and other forms of credit is a way of life and for them increases of this nature make it even harder. So this budget didn't contain any housing for people living on lower incomes. There's no direct transfers I've we heard. There's nothing new for seniors. The story of the budget was supposed to be that it was a health care budget. And that on, a, on budget day, that's what the headlines were, it's a health care budget. Except for, oh, it turned out that we actually spent more last year on health care. So it well, while it was a large investment in health care, it wasn't an historic investment in health care uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And, and, and then we got the plan, um, which really doesn't tell us how it's going to be spent or when we can expect things to be achieved or, or what, what the outcome should be. It's, it's another marketing document. And you know, when we talk about stories, the Premier likes to talk about people who govern by sound bites, and he accused us of doing that a lot. And it just seems to me that that's, that's really what we were seeing. And I've spoken about this before, how when you have a, a partner who likes to accuse you of things and it turns out it's exactly what they're doing, and that's what, that's what was happening over here, is a government by sound bites. But when you look for the evidence of what's actually there, there's no there there. And so if we look at this health care budget, what I can tell you is my, our caucus here, we are getting so many reach outs right now from people in our constituencies or people we know from other constituencies and they're mad as heck. And they're mad as heck because, well, they have COVID. And it turns out for them, even really fit people. We're hearing from people who, are, who have COVID and they're sick and it's been 11 days and they're a small business person and they can't go to work and they're mad as heck because these were no longer mandated. And, the re and these are no longer mandated and there are no gathering limits and people are going to big events and they're coming home and they're sick. And they're not just a little bit sick, they're really sick. I, ha I had a text from a, a, a former constituent who, who is really convinced he ought to be suing the province for loss of income because of this. Of course, by the time you hire a lawyer, he wouldn't recoup the money. So. It's not going to happen, but the truth of the matter is there, people are, are waking up to the fact that there's COVID everywhere and it didn't have to be like this. And then, and then we hear from people who've, who've taken their sick children to I, the IWK and, and the ER is, is jammed. And, and the ER is jammed because there's more sick kids with COVID than we've ever seen before. And again, this was avoidable if the government had, oh, I don't know, continued to leave in place some very basic public health measures that have protected this population all throughout, all throughout the pandemic. But that didn't happen. So it's not compassionate. And there's, they may have money in the budget for health care, but the way they're going now, gosh, we're going to need it because we've got a lot of sick people. By every measure, health care is worse in their short time in office. We know that, that, that long-term care workers aren't showing up for their shifts because they're sick. And again, we didn't take health care measures because we were mean or zealots. We did it because you have to protect the health care system. And they're not doing that. So pe people aren't showing up for their shifts, whether it's in long-term care or whether it's, it, it's in our, our hospitals. People are not showing up for their shifts because they're sick. Hospitals are above capacity. 
ERs are closed. We just got word that one in the riding of Annapolis is closed for weeks again. During COVID, during a pandemic, closed the ER again. It was closed for months in the fall, and now it's closed again. And we were told, Nova Scotians were told that every day under this government, healthcare would get better. But wait times are up. Well, we heard that in long-term care, 400 pe people got moved out of, long, out of, long, out of uh, hospital and into long-term care, or into home care. But the problem is, nobody's showing up for their home care. So we have seniors waiting for meals, waiting for care, waiting to have their bedding changed or their diapers changed, and that's not happening. And we heard tonight about, about a woman who had just given birth and she kept being expecting to be ad admitted to hospital and, and staying there. And, and she just heard from her family doctor, she should be in hospital. They have no place to put her. Surgery wait times aren't any better. They're worse. They're canceling surgeries all over the place. And the reason is COVID. We're up to 178 deaths now. 178 deaths since Omicron hit in December. The supposed mild, mild illness, and for some people it is mild. For some people it's like a cold. But for an awful lot of people, including healthy people, but for an awful lot of people who are vulnerable, either because, because of their age, or because they have pre-existing conditions, or they live in precarious health, for those people, it is not a mild illness. We are not protecting our elderly. We are not protecting our, our most vulnerable neighbors. And that's the story that we, we have right now in health care. What we do have in this budget is what was billed to us. And again, it's a story. This was going to be about, about creating more housing for people who need housing here in Nova Scotia. And as we see our population grow, we have a, we have a premier and a campaign saying, come to Nova Scotia, come to Nova Scotia. I don't know where the people who are going to come to Nova Scotia, and gosh, we'd love to have more healthcare workers and uh, tradespersons, but where are these people supposed to live? And it feels a little cart before the horse here to be saying people move here, like what are we going to do, Send up, set up tents on, on the commons and put them in? Um, so we're, so we're having people come to this province and or, or as, as I heard about the other day, companies that want to set up here in the province, a financial company um, wanted to move here, a lot of accountants paying um, an average salary of $100,000 a year. They couldn't find places for their people to live. They're not coming here now. Without housing, they've got a problem. And there's, there's nothing in here to help with that. Uh, the Financial Post had a story yesterday, and I hope my uh, colleagues will indulge me if I quote from it for a bit. It's entitled, William Watson, New Taxes Mean Farewell to Nova Scotia. And I don't think that was the song that the government was hoping to hear coming out of this budget. Maybe it would be We're in the Money, but it wasn't Farewell to Nova Scotia. Um, and so it talks, you know, a lot about who, uh, who this tax is, the tax is aimed at. Um, and, and, it, and then it goes on to talk about the theory that was behind this, that suddenly, um, you know, people would sell their mansions and uh, other people would buy them, but really, who's going to buy the, the expensive ones? 
and of course, there is the issue of winterized cottages. And we had quite a conversation about that the other day. You know, I had uh, I looked up what the uh, average temperatures were uh, are in Nova Scotia, and and I'm pretty sure we need to have winterized cottages here if people are going to rent them out. Because um, you know, I look at in in November the low is zero, and in December the low is minus six, and in January minus 10, in February minus 10, in March minus six, April zero, May five. You know, maybe maybe you could be living in there, but it could be a little dicey. These are the, some of these, many of these properties are not winterized, and they are not going to turn into, suddenly into uh, desirable year-round rentals without a fair amount of money going in. And so, and so the author of this particular story, uh, William Watson, in the Financial Post, notes says, even so it's hard to believe big numbers would be involved. The provincial minister of finance, bless him, said, there is no way to concretely know for sure until this is implemented, unquote, what its effects will be. Candor of this purity is rare in politics. Is it too late for and I will paraphrase now, uh, the member for Inverness, uh, to run for federal conservative leader. So, so I have to say to the finance minister, there's somebody who's trying to draft you. <laughs> um, and then he adds, I'd add only that I... Uh, I'd add only that even after implementation, people will argue about what the taxes effects were. So he very much does uh, does doubt about the efficacy of of this particular uh, um, measure, and I will uh, table that particular story. And then we go to the story that my colleague, uh, my colleague from um, King South. I'm so used to the federal writings, <laughs> um, and uh, which was uh, entitled "My Fellow Canadians, Nova Scotia Doesn't Want You," and it's written by Noah Richler or Rickler. I'm I'm sorry, but Rickler. Richler. Richler, thank you. Um, <laughs> Who is who is a uh, who lives in Nova Scotia for part of the year in Sandy Cove, and um, he uh, he has a story here, and he, and you know he's not happy about this. I have to say, um, and he notes that that in fact this is um, a very different measure than what we have seen in other provinces. And, and, and there was talk, uh, we all heard talk at law amendments about a potential uh, charter-based challenge to the constitutionality of the new taxes. And he goes on to note, the challenge is viable because unlike the BC speculation and vacancy tax to which it is sometimes compared, the Nova Scotia version with levies that are four times as great is not a tax on houses, but on people, which is how the paraphrasing here, government has always intended it, out-of-province property owners own 3.6% of Nova Scotian homes. But this quotient pales next to the number of individual multiple property owners who are full-time residents and who are presumably also even more significantly excluding ordinary Nova Scotians from being able to afford a home. But rather than mine this infinitely more remunerative stream, and then, he, and then there's an aside, 21.6% of full-time Nova Scotia residents are multiple property owners, accounting for 40.9% of properties owned, and, and that's the end of the aside. Non-voters are the ones being strong-armed. And he goes on to say that the Premier would only say, I don't want there to be any kind of misunderstanding of the contribution that I and the government believes sick that the non-residents make, they do improve their properties, they do eat out. Mr. 
Richler goes on to note that they also take up space. And then he takes aim at our, our Minister of Economic Development. The appetite of non-residents for property, he says, she said, and here he quotes with her, quotes her, moved inland during the pandemic, unquote, with, quote, the effect of squeezing out our own, unquote. And then, quote, people from other areas of the country abroad are finally seeing opportunities here for good jobs and a life, end quote, and room must be made for these permanent rather than seasonal residents, turning the tide on generations of Nova Scotian out migration. And he goes on to quote the minister as saying, for too long, we collectively bought into the idea that you had to leave Nova Scotia to prove your mettle, end quote. And he goes on to note that that's not true. We didn't lose generations of workers to an idea. Nova Scotians moved away because there were no meaningful jobs in the province for many years. And it's not going to be an idea that changes that, but a policy, and this is not the right policy. And he has some very strong words near the end of it. Um, some, some of his Nova Scotia friends, he said, are sympathetic and alarmed. And he goes on to say, a few, even before the Conservatives' coercion, suggested my partner and I make Nova Scotia our principal residence. And truth be told, the trickster in me likes the irony of this idea, that as an aging couple, we would in the long run end up costing far more to the province than the Nova Scotia is able to reap from us now. But we're not about to be coerced by unparliamentary term at the border, rifling through our pockets and demanding the keys to the house in the name of an ill-conceived, unresearched housing property that will ultimately backfire if it is not doing so already. And I will table that. So at the end of the day, we have, we have the story of the budget. The, the story of the budget was supposed to be that it was a health care budget, but it wasn't a health care budget because we don't even know what it's going to be spent on. We don't know what the timelines are. We didn't see a big increase in staff at the, at the department. We just, we don't know. There's no there there at all. <coughs> What there was in here was a tax, and it was a tax on a certain group of people. And so it turns out that that tax wasn't there to raise money for housing, because it's not going, as, as my colleague uh, from Coal Harbor uh, su suggested we do, Coal Harbor Dartmouth, um, suggested uh, we, in fact, direct the money to uh, the municipalities to pay for housing, but it's not going there. It's going into general revenues. And in fact, what we saw was earlier this week, the Premier admitted that this tax wasn't about housing at all. He said in all Nova Scotia on, on Wednesday, but the demands on government are very significant. We have a $500 million deficit. So that's what this tax is about. It is about bringing down the deficit, which is a worthy goal. We would like to see Nova Scotia with balanced budgets. So the story of this budget is not a health care budget. It's not a compassionate budget. It is a tax grab budget. And it's a tax grab budget from people who don't vote, who cannot vote because they are not residents here. And for me, the concern about all of this is that it's not going to result in, in more affordable housing, which is what we need to help in so many areas. 
if we look at the plan to bring in health care workers, health care workers and tradespeople, ensuring that they have a place to live would be a good start. It would make Nova Scotia really attractive. But if we're not spending money on that key thing, if this money is not going to that particular concern, then why would people move here? Because if we're out there saying, hey, come to Nova Scotia, we have a great lifestyle, but you can live in a tent on the commons, don't think it's quite as attractive as it was beforehand. There's nothing in this budget that deals with Airbnbs or VRBOs. There's nothing here to deal with the long-term rentals that have come off the market and are, and in fact, as we now head into what could be a tourism season, unless the you know healthcare system is completely overwhelmed, and which was always one of our gravest concerns when the pandemic hit. And we saw what happens when a healthcare system gets overwhelmed. We saw what happened in Quebec. We have to call in the military. It does, it does nothing to help deal with the long-term rental situation. This is an overly broad and not specific tax. It just, it takes a broad brush, takes a whole group of people and says, we're gonna tax you extra. There are families who have come here for generations. They consider themselves Nova Scotians. They may in fact be Nova Scotians who did move away, who did move away to pursue opportunities because at the time there weren't any opportunities here. But there are, some, there are many families for whom this new tax will be a hardship. Not everybody who owns a house in Nova Scotia is uh, a, a vacation house in Nova Scotia is, uh, is rich or comes from family money. Sometimes the family money has, has dwindled over, over generations too. But for those families, this is going to be a hardship and they will sell. And they will remember how they felt here, how they were made to feel in Nova Scotia, that they were a cash cow and nothing more. So I do, I do commend the government for a number of the steps that they took that I mentioned off the, off, off the top. There was some help for families, for persons with disabilities, but for everybody else, for people who want, who want housing now, who need housing now, there's no sign of help. And for and for so many people who live on who live on fixed incomes, whether it's seniors or uh, persons who are who are on income assistance. The current rate of inflation is so difficult for them to deal with that this budget has to be a disappointment. It's not compassionate. I would argue it's not particularly fair. And we are disappointed with it. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Citadel Sable Island. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd really like to acknowledge my colleagues who have been speaking before me on uh, this final third reading of the FMA. Uh, I've appreciated their words, and I'm hoping that in a relatively brief amount of time, um, I will simply highlight a number of the key themes. Order, please. Uh, can we keep the chatter down, please? The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the first thing I want to do um, is actually continue on a bit of my theme about that we're not a, we're not sitting here on the opposition side to oppose for opposing sake, but actually what we're interested in is trying to help make up for a better Nova Scotia in so many ways. And I'm going to start by talking a bit about um, the financial allocation that was made to mental health in this budget. So as we know, there's about 20.4 20, $20 million dollars of an increase in mental health spending proposed in this budget. $12 million of that is going to early intervention for autism and working closely with the IWK Mental uh, Health Centre as well as Autism Nova Scotia. This is important work. This is critical work. This is about setting children and families on the right path at an absolute critical time for intervention. So this is important, absolutely. I also appreciate a productive conversation I had with the Minister of Addictions and Mental Health during estimates um, for a commitment to look into supports across the lifespan for, for folks with autism, with a particular focus on adolescent young people who often fall between the cracks and, and uh, have a hard time in school and, and receiving the required services that they need. In the budget increase, there are significant allocations to data, evaluation, and analysis, and I know the needs out there. I know people are waiting a year, in C young people are waiting a year in CBRM for their mental health treatment, and I know that that is having long-term impacts. At the same time, I also know as someone who's been around this system for a number of years that we actually don't know enough to effectively make change. So I, I support this, this investment. The recovery centers that are promised to open across the, the province are incredibly promising. The day hospital, uh, I'm curious about the plan to expand it outside of HRM. I'm curious to look at its evaluation. But again, really interesting, innovative work. However, I think it is important that, that I point out that it's not what was promised. So what was promised was an additional $80 million in change. Um, as well as universal mental health care. And so I think when I go back through these items, I, I think it's quite reasonable to say, okay, like, great, what's next? And I know we're being told to have faith, but it's hard to see where that is. I don't see it in the fiscal plan. I don't see it in the next four years. We gave the minister lots and lots of chances at estimates to explain a ramp up, to explain what was coming, um, and, and we didn't get that. And so I think for a lot of Nova Scotians, um, they may look at this and say, you know, early intervention for autism, important, but it's not universal mental health care. And data and evaluation and analysis, I bet a lot of Nova Scotians aren't going to think that was a, um, necessarily an important allocation, and they're probably definitely not going to think that it's universal mental health care. And the recovery centers and day hospital, while important to, to work with some of the most vulnerable folks in our in our uh, mental health system, again, that's not the universal mental health care that was promised. And so our role is to look at these numbers, try and understand them, and especially at the beginning of a four-year mandate, look at what government is presenting to bring forward. And we have been relying on a scattered bunch of public documents. So when the platform was available online, the speech from the throne, the mandate layers, the budget, a really intriguing part of the speech from the throne was um, the development of 90-day plans that each minister was responsible for. And then in the end, those actually weren't haven't been tabled or shared. My, my understanding from various estimates conversations is that perhaps they're not going to be made public. So again, we, 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 we really, I think, feel on this side of the table, on the side of the house, that we're lacking in information. And I know, and, and my colleague uh, from Halifax, Shabakto, spoke so eloquently on the consideration of this budget as a compassionate budget. And I think it's clear that it lacks a real answer for Nova Scotians who are facing a cost of living crisis. And again, as my honourable colleague mentioned, we know that there were one-time payouts. There were the, and the $150 is better than not having $150. But it doesn't allow for folks to have systemic changes in their lives. It doesn't allow to plan for the future, and that money is gone. And we've also been told, well, that's okay, like, you know, income assistance, it's just one program, there's other ways to access support. And that is true as well, but I think that's a very exhausting way to live. 
And I think actually the conversation around rent evictions uh, highlights how challenging this can be. Um, you know, people talk about there's a process, there's a process. So you receive a rent eviction notice and then there's a process. I think that if I received a rent eviction notice and I knew that I didn't have the appropriate income uh, to afford market rate and not that there's anything out there to rent, I'm not sure I would spend time trying to fight a pro in a process that may not, in fact, uh, deliver. I don't, you don't have time for that. If you've got two months to move out, where is your time to go fight in the bureaucracy um, for a system that you don't know um, and, uh, and try, and make, try and pull things together for your family? And so for all of us, I think people end up at our offices when they've run out of options, when pilot programs end, and when it's just too confusing to, to fill the gaps. So it's true, we do have some answers that we've talked about for the affordability crisis that we talked about throughout this session. Raise the minimum wage. Increase all social payments to match the current consumer price index. Stop clawing back serve from income assistance clients. Don't renew the rent cap, but establish an ongoing rent control regime. Build non-market housing, including public housing and truly affordable rent geared to income units. Implement permanent paid sick leave in the Labor Standards Code. Fund a universal school food program. Cover more drugs and medical devices like birth control, insulin pumps, shin grits, and advocate with federal counterparts for an expansive, truly universal pharma care program. Set us on a path to free public post-secondary education by eliminating tuition at NSCC. And actually make the investments to back up the commitment to end poverty ensuring internet and cell services are actually affordable, funding community transportation, and, in, and engaging with stakeholders, including opposition parties. We are MLAs who represent uh, communities in this province on the solutions. And I'd like to comment on a few of the uh, specific FMA elements. So we spent an enormous amount of time uh, talking about the proposed uh, non-resident property tax and I and as a member of law amendments I also spent a lot of time listening to folks there I've read every letter that's been emailed to us um, at least once and so it, I think my colleagues have done a great job of enumerating people's concerns um, and you know I think my fundamental concern is that we've also heard from public policy experts who just note this as a failed piece of public policy, potentially opening us up to a charter challenge. And I'm not gonna read anybody else's letters, well, I am gonna read more letter, but I'm not gonna read any more public policy letters, uh, but they're there. So I hope everyone saw that we have a letter from Kevin Lynch. So Kevin Lynch is an economist. He was the Federal Deputy Minister of Industry. He was the Federal Deputy Minister of Finance and he was the clerk of the Privy Council, and I will say under a range of governments, so there, this is not one, one perspective. And he lives here now, so actually he doesn't have skin in the game. Like, he's not worried about the impact for himself. But he highlights in his two-page letter that this is a failed piece of public policy. And I think that when folks like that pronounce on that, those are the type of experts that we need to learn from. Um, you know, we, and, and so many people are like, well, we do, of course, understand that you have a housing crisis. Of course, we want people to have safe, secure, accessible housing in Nova Scotia. Except that this is actually what this is about. So we proposed an amendment that would, a very simple amendment that would make that link actually uh, tangible, that would make that link real, that people are making in their heads. And we propose that all new revenue from this tax would be set aside to build affordable, non-market housing. The government didn't support that idea. And yet, at the same time, we know that people are allowing uh, sort of that as, a, as part of the rumors around this tax. So it's gonna, it's gonna help, it's for housing, it's so people are safe. And that's just not the case. I will read one more letter um, from uh, a family affected by this proposed tax. Order, please. I'm sorry, but there's still a lot of idle chatter on both sides of the house, so I'm just going to ask that you try to control it, please. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. 
The proposed tax on out-of-province homeowners seems like legislation that has good intentions of reducing housing insecurity, but in the end will do nothing but hurt rural Nova Scotia communities. A few years ago, my brothers and their wives bought a small, ramshackle, old fisherman's house in Port Felix near Canso. Most of the locals thought they were crazy, that it was too far gone, the only thing to do was tear it down and build a new house. But they gutted it, rebuilt it, and turned it into a lovely little home that people often stop to take pictures of. They have spent thousands of dollars in the local community, hiring tradespeople, buying supplies, and supporting local businesses in both Guysboro and Canso. Since then, many people have stopped and thanked them for saving and fixing up a part of their community. There are hundreds of houses like this across Guysboro County that sit empty and neglected, a reminder of families who left them behind for a variety of reasons. Houses that remain empty since the work that will be required to make them livable is simply too big of an investment for most. Over a year ago, my born and raised Nova Scotia partner and I bought one of these Guysboro country homes, a 100-year-old farmhouse that had been on and off the market for about two years. It hadn't sold because of a crumbling foundation. Extensive foundation work was going to be needed to save it. However, we fell in love with the area while visiting my brothers, and knowing it was the only place in the area we would ever be able to afford, we took a risk that we could save it and bought it. We'd always planned to retire to Nova Scotia in about 10 years' time and hoped to buy then, but the opportunity presented itself. The foundation was in worse shape than we realized, one more year and it would likely have been beyond repair. But after a summer of backbreaking work and countless trips to local businesses, that old house is now standing tall on the hill where it stood for over 100 years. And people stop and thank us for saving it, for coming into the community and spending our money and supporting the local business. And I won't, I won't continue, but I mean, we know this, right? We have actually at this point probably received well, we've received hundreds of letters and we must be nearing a thousand at this point. And so these are very real concerns that folks have raised. Um, coupled with the advice from public policy experts from within Nova Scotia and outside, that this isn't a good uh, tax measure. Um, and I, I, I mean, I truly wish the government had taken time to, to really think about this, to build the business case. I appreciated the comments and uh, run through of the cost benefit analysis from the Honourable Member from Northside Westmount from yesterday. That's the type of analysis that needs to go into public policy before we put it in place. Another tax credit that I just want to talk about is the Child Activity Tax Credit. Obviously, it is hard to argue against music and activities and sports for young people. However, the actual policy goal of this piece of legislation is not clear. So tax, tax credits are a poor way of conducting social policy. They do nothing for families who don't have the upfront ability to pay, but we want to make sure all families can take advantage regardless of their financial situation. It's a small cost to the province that's being proposed. And yet, that small cost to the province, if invested in community organizations, would allow communities to work and uh, mobilize young people in their communities across the lifespan. I have been around the Department of Finance. Uh, I know other honorable members were talking about their times as well. And this, this tax, we have very few tax levers. This one was on a list in 2008. Uh, and, you know, I can't even remember like the whole saga of events, but it comes and it goes. And it comes and it goes because it's actually not very effective about what, it, uh, what it's supposed to do, but it's also not very expensive. So it sounds good, it doesn't do much. But there we go, we have it in this budget this year. So we've heard, you know, we've heard, uh, you know, I guess one thing about a budget, as other members have said, is that it allows you to understand folks' priorities and folks' perspectives. And so we've had conversations about people making choices and making decisions. But I would argue, of course, that many people face limited or non-existent choices, impossible decisions, and nothing that can adapt to or overcome structural barriers and oppression or oppression. Not asking for folks to be uplifted. In fact, I think our public policy based on principles of respect and compassion would be better to guide us in our actions. And in a surprising, surprising move tonight, I'm going to quote the Pope. 
Um, <laughs> so, so I've been enjoying starting to work my way through this book by Mark Carney. Everyone should probably have a look at it. Um, and I thought this was an interesting perspective that actually balances, I think, some of what we heard uh, from this side of the, the, the opposition in terms of uh, you know, working towards economic development and supporting the market, and this side where we talk about compassion, rights, justice, dignity, um, and, I'll, and I'll bring this together. So uh, this is the story of Pope Francis joining uh, a, a lunch with Mark Carney and other policymakers, business people, academics, and labor leaders at the, who are at the Vatican to discuss the future of the market system. And Pope Francis surprised us by joining the lunch and sharing a parable. He observed that our meal will be accompanied by wine. Now wine is many things. It has a bouquet, color, richness of taste that all complement the food. It has alcohol which can enliven the mind. Wine enriches all our senses. And at the end of the feast, we will have grappa. Grappa is one thing, alcohol. Grappa is wine distilled. Humanity is many things, passionate, curious, rational, altruistic, creative, self-interested. But the market is one thing, self-interest. The market is humanity distilled. Your job, he said, is to turn grappa back into wine, to turn the market back into humanity. And I think that's our challenge, is to turn the market back into humanity and support a truly compassionate budget. I recognize the member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the to the member from Halifax, Shibuk, or Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. That was a great quote. Thank you for sharing that with us. So, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to add uh, my comments on behalf of the people of Cumberland North on the uh, Financial Measures Act. The very first part one of the Financial Measures Act is repealing the Canadian Free Trade Agreement Implementation Act. And when I read um, a couple nights ago, I read the Canadian Free Trade Agreement Implementation Act to see what was being repealed. Uh, one of the um, important aspects of the Canadian Free Trade Agreement Act is to remove interprovincial barriers and to make sure that we can uh, try to try to empower trade in between provinces and remove barriers. So I'm not sure why that is being uh, repealed. Uh, the power is being put in governor and council, but um, hopefully it is um, not going to put barriers in place when we really need barriers to be removed between provinces. And no one knows that better than the people that I represent in Cumberland North, and really all of the people of Cumberland County. The fact is, the members that have been uh, elected the same time as me, know that uh, they've heard me say, because I share what the people want me to say from Cumberland North, and that is they feel they have been forgotten for quite a long period of time. When the Cabaquid Pass toll was put in place in 96 or so, that just reinforced that feeling of being divided from the rest of the province. And I know I've heard people from Cape Breton say the same thing, that they feel like they're not part of of the province and the causeways there. and I can tell you that I don't know if anyone feels more isolated from Nova Scotia than the people of Cumberland County in the past. Thankful, um, thankful to the Premier and to this government when they did remove the tolls as promised for the people of Nova Scotia, for the businesses and the residents, but more work needs to be done. When the pandemic happened and interprovincial borders, uh, barriers were set up and uh, it was terrible. Probably the worst experience that many people living in Cumberland, Cumberland County had ever, have ever had to go through. You had the tolls on one side keeping you from the rest of Nova Scotia, and on the other side you had border guards keeping you from going in and out of New Brunswick. The fact is 40% of our health care workers at the hospital live in Sackville. And we won't go into all those details, but it, there is a lot of work, there is a lot of healing that needs to be done for the people of Cumberland County. And I think, I really saw it, you know, people, people will say, we don't even feel like we're part of Nova Scotia. We should just join New Brunswick. Do you, if I could have a quarter for every time I heard someone in Cumberland County say that, or 
how many times I've been asked to start a new party and call it the Maritime Party because they think we should be one maritime region. They're sick and tired of being part, a part of a, a region of Nova Scotia that is forgotten. So there's a lot of work to be done to remove barriers. So we'll see what happens with uh, this Canadian Free Trade Agreement Implementation Act being repealed and what the plan is there. I think nothing uh, emphasized it to me. I always thought, well, yes, Cumberland County, we do tend to get the short end of the stick, but you know, we'll, we'll keep making sure that our voices are heard, and I kept working on that. And then one day, the mayor of Cumberland County, the mayor of Amherst, myself, a couple of other uh, councillors had a meeting with the deputies from Environment and uh, Transportation, TIR at the time. And it was about the uh, barrier set up at the Nova Scotia border. It was in January when it was put right on the Trans-Canada Highway. Um, those cement barriers. Uh, people were very concerned. There wasn't enough lighting. Speed limits normally 110 kilometers an hour and people were driving up uh, and almost hitting. There was like not enough signage. And the former uh, Minister of Transportation uh, is now our mayor. And he begged and pleaded for the deputy ministers to listen and remove this from our Trans-Canada Highway to prevent an accident. And during that conversation, the deputy minister made reference to um, the border and counting people that come into the province and numbers and data and how they do that now at the Cobbquid Pass. And in that conversation, I said, excuse me, can, you just, can I just clarify something? And he said, sure. And I said, did you just say that you count the number of people that enter the province of Nova Scotia at the Cobbquid Pass? And he said, yes. I said, that. And the mayors were <laughs> unbelievable. People are just in disbelief. And I share that story with you because you need to know that when I bring the voices of the people of Cumberland North and Cumberland County, that it's a lot of frustration because they do not feel like they are part of this province. And when you start counting people that enter the province of Nova Scotia at the Cobbquid Pass, that sends a pretty, pretty strong message about what the bureaucrats here in the offices in Halifax think of Cumberland County. Now, it was within a day or two that it got moved back to the border because of uh, the disbelief that myself and the mayors had at that meeting. But that spoke volumes to us. So I'm going to speak about the needs of the people of Cumberland County and what we're seeing in this budget. And the first thing that I think needs to be of great importance to all Nova Scotians, including every MLA, is the Chignecto Isthmus. And I've brought that up a few times. We all know that there's absolutely no money uh, allocated for the Chignecto Isthmus. I'm confident that, it will, there, that we will see something in next year's budget. I'm definitely concerned about the lack of interest that our province, historically, maybe the, the new minister will take an interest, but we've kind of left everything up to New Brunswick to lead the Chignecto Isthmus uh, infrastructure study. And really, Nova Scotia hasn't, there's a bit of knowledge in our department, but we have not definitely not taken a lead. Uh, CN Railway, I had a meeting with them. They said no one from Nova Scotia, they haven't heard from anyone from Nova Scotia about the concerns with the CN line uh, for, over, for a few years. So we definitely need to make the Chignecto Isthmus a priority so that Nova Scotia does not become an island. And it is a real threat from the rising sea levels. It's well known. And like in the um, information that I quoted to this morning in question period, if there is a disruption uh, to the CN Rail Line and Trans-Canada Highway, we're disrupting uh, $52 million a day or $35 billion worth of goods in a year. So we're, we're cutting off the, the goods that would come into the port of Halifax, the Halifax International Airport, from getting to their destinations, which can be anywhere in Canada, anywhere in the eastern seaboard. So we need to prioritize the Chignecto Isthmus, the protection of it. We need to rebuild those dikes, and we need to just get the work done. When the study was released, the Premier said that he wouldn't commit to a timeline. They're looking at maybe 10 years. Guarantee you, guarantee you, there will be damage before 10 years. And we will have a disruption 
in our critical infrastructure system if that is not repaired. And the report states that. I quoted that this morning in the report. So we need to look at the effects of climate change, and one of them is the direct uh, impact on rising sea levels that we see right here in Nova Scotia in the Bay of Fundy, and the impact uh, on the Chignecto Isthmus. And, and we hear the Premier talk a lot about, and the team minister from uh, Cumberland South, about the Atlantic Loop, which is very exciting. Well, the Atlantic Loop will go right through Cumberland County, right through the Chignecto Isthmus, connecting with New Brunswick and Quebec, Newfoundland, and then back around. Uh, we need uh, to ensure that we have uh, protection of that Chignecto Isthmus and take care of our Mother Earth. Healthcare. I have no idea why we would be having a spring session and the health plan would be released on the day that we all go home. I haven't had time to read it yet because we've been in here in the house since 9 o'clock this morning, but it seems a little bit bizarre. And from someone who used to be a part of the team that used to talk about uh, what is he hiding with McNeil, that was the big uh, tagline. I don't understand what they're hiding and w why you would be so lack of transparent and table rush us out of this legislature and table uh, a health plan on the very last day so that none of us have had, would have a chance to take a look at it. It's very bizarre, certainly not transparent and, and disappointing to say the least. So I wasn't planning on talking about paramedics uh, a great deal when I first started this <coughs> spring session. But uh, within the first week, we had a situation in Cumberland County, and this woman is asking me to tell her story. Her husband died. Her partner died. There was no, Cumber there was no ambulances in Cumberland County. One had to come from Anaganish, and if you know the geography, that's about a two-hour drive. Ambulance was probably going as fast as possible, so it took me about an hour and 45 minutes. Her husband did not make it. He's 55 years old. That is the state of our ambulance emergency health care services here. One week later, we had a youth on the side of the road. Someone came along, found them. They needed emergency health care. The person called 911 three times. No ambulance ever came. An off-duty police officer came along and an off-duty paramedic. They called police and the police took the person, ended up taking the person in the back of the police car. I have another good friend who is a doctor. And her friend called her up and said, uh, I think I might be having a heart attack. I think I might be dying. And that doctor knew there was no ambulances in Cumberland County at that time. And she said, I'll be there in five minutes. And she put her in her car and drove her to the hospital. I have another, and she would have died. She was having a massive heart attack. She ended up actually needing a pacemaker inserted uh, later that day. I have another elderly woman who took her husband into the Pugwash Hospital, and he was having a, a bleed, aortic bleed. And, um, oh sorry, it was intestinal. And he said, you need, uh, your husband needs urgent abdominal surgery right now, ASAP. No ambulance available. This 80-year-old woman drove her husband to the Amherst Hospital. He had emergency surgery, and he made it. And the surgeon told her, if you did not drive your husband, he would not have made it. So that is the state of ambulance services and emergency health care services in Cumberland County. It needs to be a priority. So I wasn't planning on, on making it, but just even in the short uh, couple of weeks that we were here, we had uh, those three situations happen. And uh, we need to make uh, an investment. And I know that there was some investment, and I know in... Uh, in the, the beds um, that they use, uh, mechanical, so that it's not so hard on their backs, but we need much more significant and urgent investment and change. And, and our private company, Medivy Blue Cross, that are providing the services, they need to be held accountable. We need to be penalizing them if they can't meet performance standards. And as we move, as the government moves to using more private companies uh, like Maple, and when you're dealing with the private company of um, Nova Scotia Power, there has to be performance standards and there has to be some accountability. And if Medivy Blue Cross cannot do it, then we need to make a change. The people deserve better. The people, uh, this woman did not deserve to lose her husband because there, she had to wait an hour and 45 minutes for an ambulance from Anaganish. So 
one of my solutions that comes from the people uh, that I represent is we need to work as a maritime region. We should have a maritime clinical health care strategy. If there is an ambulance 10 minutes away in Sackville and there's the next closest one is in Antigonish, why shouldn't we be using the one in Sackville or vice versa? Let's work together as a region. Let's work together as a region. We're seeing it uh, really uh, since the pandemic again. Uh, all of our oncology patients, I've got a woman right now, she's in her early 30s. Her mother and her want me to talk about her situation because they know they're not the only ones and they know it's not right. But our oncology patients always went to Moncton. They got their chemo and radiation in Moncton. We're the only regional hospital in the province that does not administer chemotherapy. And the uh, nurse, she was told she's not allowed to talk to the MLA because she, she's the one that identified to me that um, there's no chemo in our hospital administered and that we're the only one in, in, the, in the province. So the solution from Nova Scotia Health was to silence her instead of um, having a good relationship uh, with the MLA to be able to communicate the needs of the people. So people that used to go to Moncton right up until the pandemic for chemo and radiation now have to travel to Halifax. So I've got a young woman, she has two young children, she has breast cancer, and to get chemo instead of driving 40 minutes each day and being able to drive, come home and sleep in her own bed with her partner and be there with her children, she has to come here to Halifax and stay in a hotel and uh, pay those extra expenses and be away from her family during a very, very difficult time. And the family's very upset. So because we've had a lack of collaboration and move away from collaborating with our fellow uh, New Brunswick um, province, uh, it's impacting patient care and it's impacting health outcomes. We're seeing the same thing with dialysis about a month ago. I don't know if you saw it in the news. But um, uh, the member from Cumberland South, he has a six-bed dialysis unit in, in Spring Hill and All Saints Hospital. And then all the other dialysis patients have to travel to Moncton. And they don't mind it because they get to see a nephrologist every day, plus all of their medic medications are paid for in uh, New Brunswick. They pay for all of their dialysis unit uh, medications, which can be between $1,000 and $1,500 a month. Anyway, about a month ago, the nurse at the dialysis unit at George Dumont told the patients, two weeks, in two weeks' time, you guys are done. We're not providing dialysis to you, Nova Scotia patients anymore. Nova Scotia needs to take care of you. So you can imagine if you're a dialysis patient that travels three days a week and you're told, uh, sorry, but in two weeks' time. So that caused a lot of... Uh, anguish and strife and stress and uh, thankfully our renal team here in Nova Scotia met with the New Brunswick team and uh, they uh, put that fire out and they're working on solutions and we need to see more of that but that those patients that should never have happened in the first place with their patients but we need to see more collaboration you know, the fact is our IWK serves all of the maritime provinces during the pandemic we had people traveling from New Brunswick. They arrive here and they say, oh, sorry, we're not seeing you because you're out of province, but during COVID. And we've had a lot of, a lot of challenges. So we need to work together more. Mental health, uh, cancer care, dialysis, doctors, family doctors, uh, and psychiatrists. Nurses, I've spoken with the minister from Advanced Education. This is something we've been pushing now for, for three years or more. He's told me that we're getting close to, to getting there, and that is uh, providing access to LPN education uh, to become a registered nurse, regardless of where they did their studies. And I don't see anything in the budget for that, but I, I was assured. So in order to enable that, that, we need more placements for the RN program. But right now, you are only eligible to advance from being an LPN to an RN in that two-year bridge program if you've done your studies at NSCC here in Nova Scotia. Well, the fact is a lot of LPNs are from Ontario or Alberta or the, NERT, the LPNs in Amherst. A lot of them studied in New Brunswick because it's 40 minutes away. 
Well, they're penalized. If they want to become a registered nurse, guess what? You need to start at ground zero. Even if you've been an LPN for 15 or 20 years, none of it is isn't considered. So that is being worked on. I'm really happy to say, yes, I know, it's awesome. Yep. We will celebrate. We've got a lot of LPNs waiting, waiting. And I was really excited to see in the budget the increase of nursing seats uh, throughout the province. But I, you know, I just have to say, there's no registered nursing college in Northern Zone. So Pictou, Colchester, or Cumberland County have no training for registered nurses. So CBU got an increase of 200 seats. Awesome, my, my daughter is studying to be a nurse at CBU right now. She's actually doing exams today and tomorrow. But um, we really need a satellite site in Northern Zone. And I, you know, I'm fine, it doesn't have to be Amherst, I'd love it to be in Cumberland County, but in Picto or Turo or Cumberland, uh, we need to have our share of those nurse, uh, registered nurse training seats. So uh, let's, let's bring a satellite site and make that a priority because nursing right now, uh, I, I didn't have a chance to ask a question to the minister, but when you hear uh, numbers like 106% bed capacity, um, my question is, uh, is that including all the beds that are closed? Because I know Cumberland Regional is not the only one, but there's a lot of beds closed right now due to lack of nurses. And so I'm not sure if that 106% uh, percent is counting that, but we need to get our beds open. We need to get all of our acute care beds open in this province and, uh, and get our, our new nursing home beds filled up. And I know that the Minister for Long-Term Care and Seniors is working on that. I know she's very passionate and loves, uh, loves her seniors. So when we get those uh, nurses and, and to, to even bring more nurses here, the Nova Scotia Health have told me, Elizabeth, we need more housing. We've had nurses that want to come and they got no place to live. So I, I'm excited that the government uh, have made housing a priority. I'm a little disappointed, uh, as are the people in Cumberland, that we're not seeing more of a rural Nova Scotia focus. And we're seeing a big focus on HRM, and it's great for HRM, but half of the population of this province is in rural Nova Scotia, and that they should be having the, the same equal focus. I don't, I don't really understand why. Yeah, I mean, half of the members are definitely are from rural Nova Scotia as well. But uh, it, when I talked to the business development officer in Amherst, he says uh, housing is the number one barrier right now. It's the number one issue. It's what we're seeing in my office. Many of you are probably seeing the same uh, with people coming in and they literally have no place to live. And it's not just people uh, in low income. It's, it's students, it's seniors, it's uh, people of all socioeconomic levels. But the most heartbreaking situations are the people that are homeless. And I know the Minister of Community Services has been working with um, several, several groups, and community services have done a great job in our community sort of trying to help fill the gaps. We had a, we had a private rooming house with 20 people burn, uh, and 20 people were displaced in the fall, and they had no place to go, literally. Community services came in, they worked with our homelessness uh, group and provided wraparound services and were, and were there for people. And it, it really meant a lot to, to the people in our community and it, it was a big help at a time that they really needed it. And we have an incredible society that is working on building a, they don't want to call it a shelter, they want to call it emergency transition housing. They're working on that and very confident that that will be coming to fruition soon. But I was really um, moved by the words of the member from Halifax, Shabucto, and I'm going to really miss him. Really miss him. He's still going to come? Okay, he's still going to be here. Good. That's good. Um, just when he's talking about compassion, and um, it's true. Uh, he always, he speaks, and I feel like he's such a voice for those people, uh, for, for all people, but especially those people in need. And I know he used to be a, a United Church minister, maybe he still is, and when I hear him speak, it, it, I do have to share a scripture, he makes me think of James uh, 127, and it is, uh, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their time of need. And I, when I hear the members speak, 
He has such a heart for those people in need, and it's so evident. It's so evident. And we need to take care of those in need. We all need to always uh, be folks on that. And back when I had my first business was a health clinic, and all of my clients were physicians. And, you know, I love them, but some of them really drove me a little crazy when it was contract time and, you know, nitpicking dollars. And, and I was so frustrated. I talked to one of my girlfriends at church. She said, remember? Remember what our mission is, and it's to take care of orphans and widows. And they're not orphans, <laughs> orphans and widows, so don't feel so bad for them. But sometimes it's good just to re bring us back and focus on what's really important. And there's a lot of people in our, in our province and in our communities that are in desperate need. They're in desperate need of compassion and caring and, and love, and we need to wrap our arms around them and help them. And one of the first people I met is in a, as MLA, came to my office, he was desperate. He said, you gotta come to my house and see. And I went and the landlord hadn't paid the bills. There was no heat, but there was still electricity, but there was no oil. And he had his oven opened and he was trying to heat his apartment with, with his oven, with his stove. And we found him a place to live the very next day, but we still stay in close touch. He's one of my favorite, Terry, Terry Godfrey, if he's listening, he's one of my favorite constituents. Bonnie Petten. I want to say she is an incredible woman. She was just diagnosed with ALS. And Bonnie wanted me to talk in the legislature this session about the lack of supports for people with disabilities. And the member from Halifax Shabukdo spoke uh, so well. I mean, all the members from the NDP did just about the, um, the fact that there was no increase in this budget for people on income assistance. And really, when you look at the uh, rate of inflation, people are seeing actually a decrease, which is kind of heartbreaking when you think of what these, uh, you know, what people are trying to live on. Well, Bonnie was just diagnosed with ALS. She's in a wheelchair with literally within six months, she went from being a healthcare professional to not being able to take care of herself. And the one thing that saved her is when she signed her mortgage, she took out that disability. And if it wasn't for that, like she would not be able to stay in her own home. But we need to do a better job of providing the supports, not just enough, mm -hmm. but enough that they can live and actually have some dignity, have some dignity and some self-worth. So I do want to just say thank you for all of the words from uh, the member from Halifax, Shabukdo. Moving a couple other things I want to mention, healthcare related, and I've had, um, I've had meeting with the Minister of Justice, but uh, we don't see anything significant in this budget around sexual assault, domestic abuse. There's huge deficiencies for victim services. I think, I think all people know that in our province, but it's, um, it's very devastating to meet and talk with victims. And we've also talked, the Minister of Justice and I have also talked about the challenges right now. There's definitely a misogynistic culture in the Department of Justice and law enforcement, victims are coming forward. Many times they're not being listened to, many times charges are not being laid. Uh, when there is evidence there, we've seen cases dropped because of Jordan's rule uh, during this pandemic, sexual assault cases. And uh, let me tell you the message that that sends to victims and the message that that sends to police who have collected evidence and finally feel like they've got a finally you're going to get a perpetrator behind bars, uh, and then to have the sexual assault case uh, dismissed or thrown out because of the length of time due to the pandemic. And my understanding of Jordan rule, I, you know, one person's too many. If you're the sexual assault victim and your case has been thrown out, um, that is, I don't know the actual numbers. I'm waiting. The minister was, uh, is going to get me that information. I know of one, and that one is one too many, and that person's life will never be the same. And her perpetrator, the law enforcement, had evidence. They said, finally, they finally are going to get this person behind bars. That person was known to police to drug women and sexually assault them. They were never able to get enough evidence. They finally did, and the case ended up getting dropped because of Jordan's rule. Now, my understanding with Jordan's rule is that if there is uh, extenuating circumstances, then cases are not supposed to be dropped. So I would consider a pandemic to be extenuating circumstances. So I don't, I don't know why 
that was not taken into consideration. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done on investment and uh, culture change, definitely, and that's going to take some work. The Veterans Medical Clinic I had a meeting with Daryl Sampson today, a uh, member of parliament. He's the secretary uh, to, the, to the Minister of the uh, Veterans Affairs. And he wants to work with our Premier, so I'm really excited about that, to get a Veterans Medical Clinic here in Nova Scotia. And I shared the story with him about my grandfather when he started needing health care. I invited him to come live with my husband and I with four little kids, and he said, no thanks. <laughs> no thanks. I think at the time they were two, four, six, and eight. He said, if I ever need uh, nursing, uh, nursing care, I love you, I know you're a nurse, but I want to go to the veterans wing at Highcrest. And what I said to, to uh, Member of Parliament Daryl Sampson is, veterans uh, need to know the care is there for them when they need it. And that's the one thing with the nursing homes, that they do know that right now. Well, they need to know it's there for acute care as well. So uh, looking forward to seeing our, our government hold up their commitment to veterans to open a veterans medical clinic here in the city at the Camp Hill Hospital. The member from Kings North went into great detail, and I also did in my supply speech. So I won't go into great detail, but I did have quite a few comments from uh, people from Cumberland North about their concern about the uh, budget. They, they assumed that a progressive conservative government would have a fiscal, fiscally responsible uh, budget. Um, so to see six years of projected deficits is quite concerning. And, and they were very surprised to see that. In seeing an increase in the net debt to GDP ratio, which is going to be up to 40 percent, is going to impact our interest rates and um, hopefully, we will see a change of heart in the uh, future financial planning for this province. So, I didn't see anything in the budget about local food. I know that is a priority of the government, so hopefully we'll see that in next year's budget or have some work done between, uh, between now and then. Certainly during the pandemic and it's continuing with the war in Ukraine and Russia, the supply chains are weak and that is leading to increased inflation throughout the world, not just Canada and Nova Scotia. But we need to make sure we can feed ourselves as a province. We need to make sure that uh, we have, uh, we have redu reduction in food insecurity and uh, making food a priority is important. I did mention this to the Minister of Agriculture and estimates that Cumberland County has 30% of the arable farmland in all of Nova Scotia, 30%, uh, yet we don't have a farm rep. So I guess there's five in the province, but we don't have any in Cumberland County. We have someone assigned to Cumberland County, but they're not really there very much. So I'd love to see more support, empower our farmers, uh, Cumberland County's long been strong in the primary industries, forestry and agriculture and mining. And unfortunately, our forestry uh, industry uh, have, you know, it's been really discouraging time for them the last couple of years. And uh, we need more supports for in our agriculture industry as well. So the last thing everyone's talked about, and then I'll just make a couple more comments about it, and that is, of course, the non-resident property tax. And most of the MLAs in government I've, I've had the pleasure of working with in the past, and I know um, there was a lot of complaints over the last four years about sort of the lack of collaboration from the last government. And I am a little surprised that, that people aren't open to listening to the voices of the people with their concerns about the non-resident property tax. And that's democracy. Each of us are elected to listen to the voices of the people we represent. And, you know, I was reminded by a good friend yesterday. He said, you know, there's a couple of cabinet ministers um, from the Liberal Party that aren't, didn't get reelected, and it's because uh, the people that they used to work for didn't feel that they, that they were listened to. So 
it's just a good reminder that um, it's always important to put the people first. That's why we're here. And this non-resident property tax, I think, I think I won't go into great detail because I think we've all heard loud and clear. I'm still getting emails today. I got one from the president uh, and CEO of Fox Harbor. And he said uh, they, they were planning a huge um, const construction of a large number of homes and a lot of them would have been sold to uh, people from out of province to come and vacation here in Nova Scotia. And that is in question. And he said also, he said, if this non-resident property tax was put in place back when Ron Joyce, he's passed away now, but he was co-founder of Tim Hortons. And he said, if that non-resident, if this non-resident property tax had been place, in place when Ron Joyce was first thinking about setting up Fox Harbor, it's a five-star resort, one of the best in Nova Scotia, one of the best in Canada, uh, he uh, is predicted that he would never have invested uh, in his home community of Fox Harbor and, and Wallace area. So we have a lot uh, to consider about the damage, the potential damage that is being done. And I would be remiss if I didn't uh, speak on behalf of all of the small coastal communities that I represent from Malagash, Wallace, Gulf Shore, Pugwash, Port Howe, Linden, Northport, Amershore, Lornville, Tidnish, Tidnish Bridge. They're all coastal communities. We have 2,150 plus non-resident properties in Cumberland County alone. And uh, there's a huge concern. And out of those 2,150 non-resident property owners, I think I probably got emails from about a thousand of them. So, and they are not happy. They are not happy. And I've, I've mentioned this before, as our province is putting property taxes up for those non-residents, 200%, New Brunswick just lowered them. Literally two weeks ago, New Brunswick lowered their property rates for their own people, but also for non-resident people by 15%. So we're sending a very different message. Theirs is welcoming, ours is punitive. I did want to table a document. Um, I didn't table it the other night, but it is the article where the Minister of Finance talks about um, people that have seasonal cottages, uh, that they could just go ahead and winterize them. So I wanted to make sure that was tabled, as well as this document here, farewell to Nova Scotia. So I will table that document as well. And I'm pretty sure the government is aware that a former PC government tried to do the same thing and passed a non-resident property tax and then actually studied it out and made a decision that it was uh, the wrong thing to do. So I'm going to table that document as well. It's called the Non-Resident Land Ownership in Nova Scotia Final Report. If the Minister of Finance and Premier haven't read that, I recommend, highly recommend that they, that they do so. And lastly, I'm going to table a letter from a man that I have much admiration and respect for, his name is George Cooper. And I try to listen to people that are smarter than me, which most people are. He, uh, but this is a man who I admire greatly. I don't know if any of you know him, but he, uh, he shared a very intelligent thoughts on this non-resident property tax. Uh, just, just for people here, in case you don't know who George is, mm -hmm. I'm just going to give you a little history on George. And this is why we should listen to him. George Cooper is a lifelong full-time resident of Nova Scotia. He's now retired, worked in Nova Scotia all of his life, practiced law for 50 years, was a PC candidate for the Nova Scotia legislature in 74 and a PC member of parliament from 79 to 80, served in the, as president of the University of King's College from 2012 to 2016, was managing trustee for 23 years of the Killam Trust. Uh, he's got a long CV. I won't read everything, but I'll just say he is a man, very intelligent, very compassionate. He uh, taught me a lot about Robert Stanfield, some would say one of the best premiers of this province. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to read George Cooper's letter, I would, en I would encourage you as well. But keeping in mind, um, our, our role is, as, uh, in democratic society is that the people should have the power, not government. And, and in democracy, the power belongs to the people. And we all have a responsibility 
to listen to the people. So with those few words about some of the priorities in Cumberland North and comments on this uh, provincial budget, I will close my comments to third reading, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Good job. Good job. If I recognize the minister is to close debate on bill number 149. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> um, Mr. Speaker, I was actually prepared to wait a bit longer. <laughs> I've been waiting a while, uh, Mr. Speaker, but I'm glad to, that members have had their chance to speak on this uh, here tonight. Mr. Speaker, um, I have a speech. I, I do have a couple of comments uh, specific to some of the comments made here tonight. And I think about um, one comment made by the official opposition that our health budget, budget spending is really not that much different from their spending in their last year of their government, Mr. Speaker. But if you actually... Um, and these aren't my numbers, Mr. Speaker, they're Department of Finance numbers, but if you look at estimate to estimate uh, with many of the federal uh, COVID dollar flow-throughs removed, the actual increase in the health budget is close to 10%. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, I think it's important that I start out by saying that because really what this budget has been all about is health care. It's been about many other things too, but I think the takeaway is, yes, a deficit, but a significant increase in health care. So, Mr. Speaker, um, I think about, uh, I think about, uh, there's a couple more, but I'm gonna save them for later. Mr. Speaker, I rise to close debate on third reading of Bill 149, the Financial Measures Act. I'd like to thank everyone who put forward comments and thoughts on this. Through this act, we are delivering on the commitments we made to Nova Scotians to find solutions for our province's most pressing challenges. We know Nova Scotian employers are struggling to find skilled tradespeople, and other sectors are experiencing labour shortages as well. This is seen across the province in both urban and rural areas. Labor shortages have detrimental impact on the ability of our entrepreneurs to grow their businesses and therefore for our provincial economy to grow. There is a lot of excitement about the More Opportunities for Skilled Trades or MOST program. By amending the income tax through this legislation, we can create new regulations to establish a tax refund for Nova Scotians working in designated skilled occupations such as construction. Starting for the 2022 tax year, most will return provincial income tax paid on the first $50,000 of earnings for eligible people under the age of 30 in sectors with labour shortages. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we know there's a lot of interest in this program and I look forward to sharing more details in the future. We expect most to have a positive impact on Nova Scotia's ability to attract and retain young people in sectors facing labour shortages. There are tremendous opportunities ahead for our province and we want to do everything we can to make sure businesses and our people can succeed. Mr. Speaker, there's been much debate in this House around the new non-resident property tax measures. Our province is experiencing population growth that we haven't seen in decades. And this growth, while helping to grow our economy, has placed tremendous strain on our housing market. We know housing prices have risen upwards of 30% in the last year alone. These new measures, a non-resident property tax of $2 per $100 of assessed value and a provincial deed transfer tax of 5% for property purchased by non-residents of Nova Scotia, are aimed at helping Nova Scotians to find a place to live. I'd like to address some of the points that have been raised in debate. Mr. Speaker, some have said these new measures send the wrong message, that Nova Scotia is not a welcoming place. In fact, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia is welcoming newcomers in record numbers. 
Our population reached 1 million at the end of the year 2021, and we celebrated a record year for immigration. More people than ever before want to move here to live, to work, and build a life. Nova Scotians and their government are embracing their arrival with open arms. The opportunities ahead of us are due in no small part to the tremendous influx of new people to our province who come to work and stay, but we need to ensure there are places for these people to live. A number of my colleagues mentioned the letters and emails they've been receiving about these new measures. But I also know that members of this chamber have been receiving letters and emails from local businesses who can't grow their business because there are labor shortages or because potential employees cannot find places to live. And letters from constituents who can't find a house or an apartment in such a competitive housing market or from those who can't afford the options that are available to them right now. This is no longer an issue confined to the Halifax Regional Municipality. It's an issue being felt in towns and in rural areas. I see it in my constituency of Inverness, and I know that many of you have seen it in your own constituencies. These are very serious issues that we're trying to address. We are trying to make sure people can afford a place to call home and build their lives here. He was also asked how our province would react if one of our neighbours put forth a similar measure. Well, Mr. Speaker, our two closest provincial neighbours already have such measures. Prince Edward Island has had, since 1995, a program that sees non-resident property owners pay more than islanders. And in New Brunswick, everyone, residents and non-residents, pay more taxes on any property that is not their principal residence. We recognize that this is a situation, a complex situation, and important exemptions must apply. When we looked at doing this, we wanted to make sure there were not unintended consequences on Nova Scotians. When non-resident owned housing is rented out to someone residing in Nova Scotia, including international students, for 12 months or longer, the new property tax will not apply. They're providing homes for Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. When a property has multiple owners, an exemption from this tax is provided if 50% or more of the owners are residents of Nova Scotia. Properties that are not classified as residential with three or less dwelling units, including commercial properties, are not subject to these measures. And of course, all residents of Nova Scotia who purchase residential properties are exempt from the provincial deed transfer tax. If you plan to move to Nova Scotia to live, and purchase a property or home, there is an exemption from the provincial deed property tax. The individual would typically be expected to move here within six months, but we certainly have flexibility, Mr. Speaker, in cases where there may be uh, changes to that, where it might take them a bit longer to get here. We are working to address a new reality in our housing market in Nova Scotia. We need to take steps to make sure people can afford a place to call home and build their lives here. Our situation is very, very different from what was seen 20 years ago. And Mr. Speaker, it's even different from what we've seen two years ago. <clears throat> um, specific to some of the matters that um, uh, were raised by members here, um, some questions about how this is going to be done. Um, the, there is no database built yet. However, declarations over time will be used to help confirm a database with good information. But in the meantime, Mr. Speaker, there is information out there that we will use to mail out forms and whatnot, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in the case of the non-resident deed transfer tax, there is the land registry that already captures transactions and applies deed transfer tax, Mr. Speaker. In the case of the 2% non-resident property tax, public, uh, the... Uh, PVSC has addresses of all resident and non-resident property owners. So, Mr. Speaker, we have information, and over time we'll have better information. Mr. Speaker, people have asked about the cost, and I know uh, the Department of Finance uh, was not up during the budget estimates, uh, and some of the detailed questions that might normally have been asked to the Department of Finance, they, they, there was no opportunity for that. Um, so I do want to clarify, for this particular measure, 
the estimate is, is six full-time equivalent employees and total cost of approximately $700,000 to, to uh, implement this program and to manage it going forward. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> you know, one of the other points put forward was there should be a detailed cost analysis before this, is, before this initiative is undertaken. But Mr. Speaker, we know that this variable, a non-resident tax, is one of many, many variables that contribute to a decision about whether or not to purchase a property. Very difficult to be able to drill down with every transaction as to why somebody has chosen to purchase or to sell, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I can appreciate, and I'm a big fan of cost-benefit analysis, but Mr. Speaker, we're dealing with a situation here where we don't know the exact impacts, Mr. Speaker. And I want to be honest about that. <clears throat> so, Mr. Speaker, one of the things I would point out is the opportunity costs. I know members talked about opportunity costs, but I never heard anybody talk about the opportunity costs of employers who need people to expand their businesses throughout the province and have nowhere for their employers to live. Or for Nova Scotians who want to move home but can't because they can't find a property to move home to. So, Mr. Speaker, I think we must not forget that. We are hearing from many people now who are upset. And, Mr. Speaker, to me, this legislation is not about wanting to hurt people. It is wanting to help Nova Scotians, people who have chosen to live here. We are standing for them. So they... Mr. Speaker, we're standing for them so they have a greater chance to buy a home here when they're competing with people who have not chosen to make their home here. Yes, it causes some pain for non-residents, and we hear them. And we will continue to think about the concerns that they have raised. There have been very strong feelings but let us not, Mr. Speaker, forget about persons who cannot even find a property to buy when they are trying to live here in Nova Scotia. Let us not forget the employers who have people willing to move into their communities, pay property taxes, pay income taxes, help that business grow to create possibly more jobs, pay more uh, small business taxes or corporate taxes, but, Mr. Speaker, the employer knows that there is nowhere in the area for the potential new hire to live. And, Mr. Speaker, that progress is stopped before it starts. And that is an opportunity cost, Mr. Speaker. Let us not forget the Nova Scotian who lives away, wants to buy a property here, wants to live here, but cannot find one or must delay their move here. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I, I want to say a couple of other points. <laughs> um, I prefer generally to end on a positive note, but I've got to say a couple of things <laughs> before I close up here. Mr. Speaker, I think the, the chief message I heard from the NDP tonight was about compassion. And I know the leader of the NDP talked about, you know, the word compassion, it means suffering with people together. And I have a line here, Mr. Speaker, but I'm going to hold back on it tonight. It would be a zinger. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to hold back on it because the message I want to give to the NDP is no one has a monopoly on compassion. Uh. No political party has a monopoly on compassion. Mr. Speaker, I, I think about uh, comments made uh, by the official opposition about a recession in four years' time. Mr. Speaker, I want to point out um, the economists over in the Department of Finance, uh, when we were preparing this budget, one of the, the major trends of note was the fact that the economy, not just here in Nova Scotia, but really North America and around the world, were seeing a return to the trend of growth that was seen 
before the pandemic began. Where's the proof of that? We saw by the end of last year, jobs and exports were actually higher than they were before the pandemic in this province. Our population, Mr. Speaker, what is a greater driver of GDP than population growth? We are seeing significant population growth in this province. In fact, it even, it even increased federal transfer payments, Mr. Speaker. The population growth in this province impacted our federal transfer payments, health transfer, social transfer, and, uh, and also our equalization transfer. So, Mr. Speaker, we are seeing an economy that is, that is on the move. <coughs> Strangely, our greatest challenge, and you see it with a deficit in this budget, is, is trying to invest in it so that we have a health care system. What is more important than a good health care system for a growing province? And what is more important than having the infrastructure in place? And members talk about the debt. Well, largest capital budget in the history of the province, almost $1.6 billion. Much of it started by the previous government. Generational investments in health care, in the QE2, in the Cape Breton Regional Hospital, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, those are things that are critical for the future and for a province that's growing. And talk of a recession, Mr. Speaker, what if the world went into a recession in four years' time? Or our country went into a recession? Obviously, that would have an impact on Nova Scotia. And I think it would be very strange to think that Nova Scotia could cause a recession for itself all on its own, Mr. Speaker. And the Bank of Canada, Mr. Speaker, you know, I don't think they would go out on a limb and be able to predict a recession in four years' time. So I just don't buy those thoughts, Mr. Speaker. I'd rather look at the evidence of the economy and the points I've just made and what we're seeing um, in the province. So, uh, so Mr. Speaker, uh, to return to a, uh, instead of perhaps talking about chocolate bars tonight <laughs> and the caramel secret, I think I'll try to close on a, on a positive note that's perhaps less <laughs> volatile and <laughs> I think people's emotions have been stirred up enough the last number of weeks. <laughs> I, I do think it's important to try to inject a little humor from time to time too, though, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, I'll wrap up my remarks by speaking about the new children's sports and arts tax credit. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, through this credit, parents will be able to offset costs for their children's registration in sports and arts. And it's refundable, so even if you don't owe tax, you can benefit from it too. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, one of my colleagues mentioned that many fam families struggle to afford these activities and may not be able to wait for their tax refund. Well, we agree, Mr. Speaker, and that is why back in March there was an announcement of $5 million for Sport Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And that investment will support Sport Nova Scotia's work to make the sports system more inclusive and accessible. This funding will provide more accessible equipment and programs for athletes with disabilities and address financial barriers to let more children and youth take part in sport and recreation. Mr. Speaker, I would encourage all Nova Scotians to claim that credit when the time comes, Mr. Speaker. Um, because in the end, and I think this is maybe a positive note on, to, and as a positive note to end on, it's an investment in our children and our children are our future. Mr. Speaker, I move closing of third reading of Bill 149, the Financial Measures Act. The motion is for third reading of Bill number 149. My turn. <laughs> The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 149, the Financial Measures 2022 Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please indicate? A recorded vote has been called for. Till the whips are satisfied. We'll take a short recess.
Order, please. Order, please. Our Order, please. A recorded vote has been called for third reading of Bill Number 149. I recognize the clerk. Brad Johns. Yes. Tori Rushton. Yes. Barbara Adams. Yes. Kim Maslin. Yes. Tim Houston. Yes. Alan McMaster. Yes. Carla McFarland. Yes. Michelle Thompson. Yes. <laughs> John Lohr. Yes. Pat Dunn. Yes. Tim Hallman. Yes. Steve Craig. Yes. Dave Ritzy. Yes. Brian Wong. Yes. Susan Corkum Greek. Yes. Brian Comer. Yes. Colton LeBlanc. Yes. Jill Balzer. Trevor Boudreau. Yes. Greg Morrow. Yes. Becky Druin. Yes. Larry Harrison. Yes. Chris Palmer. Yes. John A. McDonald. Yes. Melissa Sheehy Richard. Yes. John White. Yes. <laughs> Danielle Barkhouse. Yes. Tom Taggart. Yes. Nolan Young. Yes. Kent Smith. Yes. Patricia Aaron. No. Tony Ince. Brendan McGuire. Oh, no. <laughs> Keith Irving. No. Ian Rankin. No. Derek Mombercat. No. Kelly Regan. No. Claudia Chender. No. Gary Burrell. Susan LeBlanc. No. Lisa Lachance. No. Susie Hansen. Kendra Coombs. No. Rafa Di Costanzo. No. Ben Jessam. No. Laura Lee Nickel. No. Fred Tilly. Braden Clark. No. Hallie Duale. No. Elizabeth Smith McCrossan. <laughs> no. Carmen Kerr. Zach Churchill, Ronnie LeBlanc. No. Angela Simmons. Results of the recorded vote are as follows, yeas 29, nays 17. Order that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Order that the bill be engrossed.
folks, uh, we're just going to uh, very briefly wait for his honor to be with us. So we'll just, everybody please stay in their seats. I'll put it that way. Let us honor the Lieutenant Governor be admitted. His Honor, the Lieutenant Governor. It is the wish of his honor, the Lieutenant Governor, that everyone present be seated. May it please your honor, the General Assembly of the province has, at its present session, 
pass certain bills to which in the name of, and on behalf of the General Assembly, I respectively request your honor's assent. Bill number 94, an act to establish a Ukrainian famine and genocide Holodomor Memorial Day. Bill number 96, an act to dismantle racism and hate. Bill number 99, an act to amend chapter eight of the acts of 2015, the Quality Improvement Information Protection Act. Bill number 101, an act to amend chapter 32 of the acts of 2015, the Marine Renewable Energy Act. Bill number 102, an act to amend chapter 504 of the revised statutes 1989, the Wildlife Act. Bill number 104, an act to amend chapter nine of the acts of 2002, the Interjurisdictional Support Orders Act. Bill number 106, an act to amend chapter 85 of the revised statutes 1989, the Condominium Act. Bill number 107, an act to repeal chapter 17 of the acts of 2003, the Crosby Memorial Trust Fund Act. Bill number 109, an act to amend chapter 217 of the revised statutes 1989, the Income Tax Act, respecting a fertility and surrogacy rebate. Bill number 112, an act to dissolve the Holy Heart Seminary. Bill number 114, an act to amend chapter 208 of the revised statutes 1989, the Hospitals Act. Bill number 115, an act to amend chapter 32 of the acts of 2004, the Prescription Monitoring Act. Bill number 118, an act to amend chapter 41 of the acts of 2010, the Personal Health Information Act. Bill number 120, an act to amend chapter 42 of the acts of 2005, the Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act. Bill number 122, an act respecting the repeal of an act to incorporate the Lunenburg Rod and Gun Club. Bill number 123, an act to amend chapter 260 of the revised statutes 1989, the Liquor Control Act. Bill number 124, an act to amend chapter 379 of the revised statutes 1989, the Public Trustee Act. Bill number 126, an act respecting a Nova Scotia Wine Authority. Bill number 129, an act to amend chapter 292 of the revised statutes 1989, the Motor Carrier Act. Bill number 131, an act to amend chapter 352 of the revised statutes, 1989, the Powers of Attorney Act. Bill number 134, an act to amend chapter 293 of the revised statutes, 1989, the Motor Vehicle Act. Bill number 137, an act to amend chapter 39 of the acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting housing. Bill number 138, an act to permit virtual business meetings. Bill number 143, an act to amend chapter four of the acts of 2015, the Boat Harbor Act. Bill number 145, an act to amend chapter 25 of the acts of 2004, the Electricity Act. Bill number 147, an act to amend chapter 380 of the revised statutes 1989, the Public Utilities Act. Bill number 148, an act to recognize, promote, and support the revitalization and reclamation of the Mi'kmaq language. Bill number 149, an act respecting certain financial measures. Bill number 154, an act to amend chapter nine of the acts of 2019, the Tourist Accommodations Registration Act. And bill number 155, an act to amend chapter 21 of the acts of 1990, the Public Prosecutions Act. In Her Majesty's name, I assent to these bills. Your Honor, having been graciously pleased to give your assent to the bills passed during the present session, it becomes my agreeable duty on behalf of Her Majesty's dutiful and loyal subjects, her faithful commons of Nova Scotia, to present Your Honor a bill for the appropriation of supply granted in the present session. For the support of the public service, and to request your honors assent thereto. 
an act to provide for the defraying certain charges and expenses of the public service of the province. <clears throat> in Her Majesty's name, I thank her loyal subjects and I accept their benevolence and assent to this bill. I would ask all the members to join me in the singing of, all, of the national anthem. Oh, Canada. the Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Speaker. Uh, before we move to adjourn, I'd like to thank a number of people that are here uh, in the House with us uh, today, tonight, uh, and people who made this session move, move along so smoothly. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of all members of, uh, of the House, I want to acknowledge the, the pages for their <laughs> dedication. Very small but uh, mighty uh, group. Thank you. Thank you so much. And tired. Uh, and, and, and tired. 
uh, the folks at Ledge, Ledge TV, thank you. <laughs> They asked if we could stop with the renovations. They want to stay right in this chamber with us, right? Is that the, no? Uh, the, the, the clerks of the house, and my goodness, Dave, this guy was uh, The staff at Ledge Council who worked to uh, draft the bills and I'm sure don't get very many revisions and amendments. Um, host operations staff, the cleaning staff, everyone who keeps everything going. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, our sergeant at arms. Uh, there were times in this session when we thought we might actually need you, too. So. <laughs> thank you, my friend. Uh, the, the commissioners, thank you to the commissioners. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna say, where would we be without our friends in the media? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you to the to the house leaders. I know this was uh, this had its moments, but thank you. <laughs> of course, our constituency assistants and our teams back in our offices that keep everything rolling uh, back in the constituency. <laughs> the entire public service. Uh, I mean, the work they put into this budget is just remarkable. <laughs> Uh, some of the most dedicated to uh, Nova Scotians, for sure, in terms of public service. They work tirelessly on behalf of Nova Scotians every single day. So thank the, thank the public service. Uh, our families uh, for, for supporting us in, in every single way possible, including, you know, keeping our, our children's lives going while we're here. At, uh, Long hours sometimes, uh, but uh, to, to our families, of course, uh, for their continued support. Uh, I want to acknowledge that. Uh, I want to acknowledge the uh, Leader of the Opposition, former Premier, MLA for Timley Prospect, Ian Rankin, uh, my friend, thank you. Thank you for your dedication to the province, and uh, I, I appreciate your, your your passion for the environment and future generations. Thank you for that. Um, and of course, I, I want to acknowledge the MLA for Halifax, uh, Shibakto, uh, leader of the NDP, Gary Burrell. Thank you, thank you, Gary, for your dedication. <laughs> Thank him for his uh, vigorous advocacy for housing and for supporting Nova Scotians. Thank you, thank you, Gary, for your support of Nova Scotians. Um, thank you um, to, um, to, of course, Mr. Speaker. But um, as as we as we wind down, thank you to each and every member of this house. Uh, it, it can get it can get tense in in here, uh, but we're all we're all have the same passion for this province, uh, and this is a great province, and we are we are fortunate. Uh, to be able to stand in this legislature and, and serve Nova Scotia. So I thank each and every one of you for your dedication to, to Nova Scotians and to your, to your constituents. I want to uh, wish everyone uh, a, a safe and healthy and prosperous, uh, productive summer. And we will see you back here in the fall. I can't wait. <laughs> well, break's going to be good, but I can't wait. Uh, but uh, but thank you to everyone. I, I, my sincere thank you on that. Um, oh, Mr. Speaker, with those with those few words, uh, I move that this general assembly uh, be adjourned to meet again at the call of the speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion is that the house now adjourn to meet again at the call of the speaker. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Contrary minded. The motion is carried. We stand adjourned. Wishing everyone a happy and peaceful summer. Enjoy.